Torontovision.tv from the world's leading think tank laboratory, buried deep in an undisclosed building in hostile territory where evil and corruption is exposed. You're about to enter the Tom Trento Show. Where evil and corruption is exposed. That's what we do around here on uh, the Tom Trento Show or TrentoVision.tv, broadcasting on this beautiful, rainy, I mean, it's raining like crazy here in South Florida on the 29th of May, Wednesday. Today is um, for all the Democrats who were real Democrats a while back. Today's President John F. Kennedy's birthday. Did you know that? And it's um, Patrick Henry's birthday. And it's Bob Hope's birthday. So uh, May 29th, 2013, a couple of minutes after 5 p.m. in the afternoon on the East Coast, Boca Raton. We're broadcasting, ladies and gentlemen, out of uh, WNN, WNN 1470 on your AM dial. 50,000 horsepower going all the way up the eastern coast of Florida through northern Miami, through Fort Lauderdale, through Palm Beach, West Palm, all the way up to uh, Orlando on a good day. So thank you for tuning in. Uh, we appreciate everybody on the radio side, on the television side, the internet television side, trentovision.tv. Um, and, and this show is going to be broadcast on our special guest site. We'll tell you about that person in a minute. Also on teapartycommunity.com, teapartycommunity.com. Hello. Let's bring CJ in and we'll both say hello to the Tea Party community people. Hello, CJ, how are you? Hi, good. <laughs> hello, Tea Party community. You guys could say hello too. Those are Hi. our friends. Hello, hello Tea Party. Oh, Abdullah, you're with us today. I am here. Oh, he wouldn't miss this show. I would not don't miss you have this a job? I mean, you come to our studio every day. We don't pay you anything. How do you do that? He gets the jizya. I am paid by my mask <laughs> to attend and keep an eye on you. Oh, you're paid by your mask. Yes, okay, uh, well. to keep an eye on you. Well, you're gonna have an interesting. You're gonna you're gonna have an interesting. Oh day yes, day. world's most famous apostate. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. We have the world's most famous apostate. Waleed Shubat is with us, ladies and gentlemen. He'll be on in just a few moments. Uh, Waleed is a former Muslim, uh, former member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And um, now a uh, fascinating individual doing amazing work. And um, well, I won't get into too much of it because we'll tell you when we, when we bring him on. But uh, he does these investigative exposés, these reports. And uh, this one is shocking. Um, I, you know, it's shocking in, in the real world, in the, uh, in the Obama nation world or the United States of Obama. It ain't that shocking in a sense. It is, of an it is not shocking in it the is Muslim world. It is an abomination. World. It is not shocking in the Muslim world either. Uh, but uh, you will be incensed uh, in indeed. And in fact, it's a two-part show. Wednesday today, the second part of Waleed Shubat's special investigative expose will be shown tomorrow, the 30th. I think the 30th comes after the 29th of May. The 30th of May. So uh, last week, as you know, we spent quite a bit of time, and here's a couple of newspapers from London. We spent quite a bit of time on, on this issue. This is the Daily Mail. I had a friend in London who was there during the, uh, the attack on uh, drummer Rigby, Lee Rigby. And um, we're going to continue with this story. We're going to be continuing with this story uh, in days ahead because... Um, it, not only is it a, a shocking, uh, heinous, horrendous uh, event, here's, uh, here's Lee Rigby right here on the Metro, um, but uh, now this copycat event's taking place, and we don't know if they're copycat events because, um, as you know, we, uh, we're students of Inspire Magazine, which is a magazine of AQ, Al-Qaeda. I love that magazine. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> and uh, Al-Qaeda uh, talks about... Um, uh, small cell jihads, uh, just um, figuring out a way in which to cause uh, mischief and trouble in the West. And on Friday, today's Wednesday, two days from today, Friday the 31st, we will have uh, Skyped in from Paris, France, an individual who um, has made his name actually and nobody knows his name, but has made a mark in, uh, in the West, in, in the world, by uh, videotaping the thousands of Muslims that shut the streets down 
in Paris on uh, Friday prayer. What's the name of Friday prayer? Juma prayer. Jumping Juma. Juma. Jumping Juma. 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 Freaky Friday, Friday. Jumping. jumping Juma, yeah. as you Freaky like to Friday. call it. Our, our <laughs> hour, for those of you who aren't regular devotees of our show, Friday is uh, Jumping Juma, Freaky Friday, Fridays. And uh, we do a little uh, evaluation of um, uh, CJ reads the updates us on the jihad attacks around the world and we talk about the religion of peace uh, and uh, but we also reach out to those Muslims well, caught up in uh, on a serious note yeah it's the um, religion of pieces well, yeah and we we're bringing Max on because parts. of something similar that happened in France we're, we're bringing a, a person on who um, is going to report on an attack that occurred in France where a soldier was standing in line and a Muslim came up behind him and tried to slice his throat um, so he's going to report on that. That's on Friday. Today and tomorrow we have Walid Shubat. And, um, but uh, our guest, our special guest on Friday will uh, go way beyond that attack and, and tell us what the, uh, what the jihad situation is, what the culture is, what the French are doing to, to fight the onslaught of Islam in their oh, country. Oh, it is fantastic um, what we have done there. I think they're capitulating. <laughs> well, on a, on a serious note, um, we, we know, because many of you communicate with us, we know that many Muslims watch our show, and um, you know they try to do opposition research. I think that's what it is. But uh, and, and we have said a million times, and we're straight out. My name, my real name is Tom Trento. I'm, I'm not hard to find. Uh, I do not hate Muslims by any means. Um, I I I don't like the ideology of Islam. It fails uh, as a theological system. It fails as a political system. It fails as a system that that can maximize what human life is all about. And uh, if you're a Muslim, please, I mean, I welcome you disagreeing. Either I'm correct, and our team here, that Islam is a, a failed system, or you're correct. Well, we're all gonna find out someday, but at least be open-minded enough to allow us to present our reasons, our evidence, and, and don't be locked into this belief, I could never reevaluate the Quran. It, is, it existed before time, and all Allah did was give it to Muhammad, and he brought it down, Gabriel through Muhammad, and, and it's here. That has to be critically analyzed. And simply because we do not accept, you know, a priori, the presupposition that the Quran existed eternally, um, doesn't make us evil people. It makes yeah, us thinking. Oh yeah, exactly. It makes us thinking people. And in fact, the individual we have as our special guest for the next two days, and, and maybe we'll get into some of his pilgrimage from Islam to Christianity. Um, uh, that individual could be uh, very insightful. So tell your friends, you Muslim folks out there that are watching, tell your friends to watch tomorrow also, uh, on Thursday, as uh, we have Waleed Chubat on. Tom, I think so. it would also be a nice time for you to invite any practicing Muslims to contact you to have either a Skyped-in debate or an in-person debate to have this conversation with Islam versus Judeo-Christian values and, and a fair debate, a non-set-up you know, so extend that out to anyone who disagrees with Tom. That's, an open That's been an open invitation since the show started. Yeah, but we probably should reiterate it. I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket. I'm going to see what. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, don't hold your breath on that one. But no, in all seriousness, um, we we can Skype in. You know, Andy uh, Chowdhury uh, from London. Anybody, any any Muslim that's uh, you don't even have to be qualified, but the the higher the more qualified you are, the better. You have an open invitation anytime to come on our show. You don't have to come in the in the bunker studio. We can do it by Skype. We'll listen to your side. We're not going to beat you up. Or you have nothing you to be afraid of. You have nothing. They will not hurt you. They, yeah. See, we got uh, Imam Abdul. I fool you, fools. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he's a here and he, 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 uh, he's alive and well. I'm so please, please, if you would like to make the bet with the Trento, you contact him. 
Very easy. Very Just easy contact to find. him. He will make debate with you. You can go to TrentoVision.tv. Tom at TrentoVision.tv. Yeah, Tom at TrentoVision.tv. Or go to Tom at the United West or just say Tom and we'll, we'll appear somewhere. Just Google Tom Trento and right. you'll find him. A lot of stuff going on. Before we get rolling with Waleed, um, our very good friend Diana West. Mazel tov. Yes. <laughs> one of, uh, one of uh, my, <coughs> uh, we're co-authors. Uh, Diana, myself, and 17 others on Sharia, the threat to America. Well, Diana wrote this book, American Betrayal. Look how little the words are. The words are so tiny, Diana. What are you doing to us? And guess what? No pictures. No pictures. She wrote a book with no pictures. Now, that's not going to fly here on Charlie our show. Charlie Hebdo okay. will be providing the illustrations. We're going we're gonna to have to provide uh, pictures uh, when, we, when we review this book. Uh, CJ just took the floating book. American <laughs> Betrayal, basically that um, her thesis is fabulous. Her thesis is that uh, after the Cold War, cool during the Cold War, many of our leaders betrayed Americans <laughs> by, by capitulating, I'm trying to explain this book, by capitulating to the Soviets, to communism, and as a result, a, uh, a mindset occurred in the United States to capitulate to these to these uh, totalitarian regimes in, uh, in, a, in a social sense, political sense. And, and she carries this over and says, this is now happening with our capitulation to uh, supremacist Islam, totalitarian Islam. So very interesting thesis, very interesting book. Uh, congratulations, Diana, getting it published. First day out today. So we're all happy about that. I hate it's that. It's 100 book. as of today. <laughs> It's 194 on Amazon already. I have a copy reserved out. for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, at uh, 12 minutes, 12 minutes past 5 p.m. in South Florida, in the United States of America, on the 29th of May, it is uh, our pleasure to bring in our very good friend and uh, Islamic expert, analyst, uh, investigator, provocateur, speaker, and all those other things, please, everybody, let's warmly welcome Waleed Shuba to the Trump Television Show. Waleed, how you doing? Good, good to have you here, sir. How you been? I've been fine, thank good, you. Good, 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 good. Um, well, we have a lot to go over over these uh, next two days. Um, a while back, uh, I, I mentioned Sharia, the Threat to America, the book that I'm privileged to be one of the authors. Well, we have a daily uh, colloquy, all the 19 authors. Um, and a couple of months ago, when you broke all that information about Huma Abedin, uh, Anthony Weiner's um, wife, uh, I mean, you lit up our email. Everybody's going back and forth, sending your material. We thought it was uh, magnificent work. So maybe in uh, today or tomorrow, we can uh, touch on uh, Uma Abedin. Because something tells me she's not going away. Uh, and something tells me she has an influence. She's due for a promotion. Yeah, it looks like that. But you just, um, <laughs> you, you just recently, you and your investigative team, uh, uh, broke a story. A spooky, scary, bizarre IRS, Obama, Kenya, Wahhabism. What is this all about? Give us an overview. What CJ has a question. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people maybe don't know who, who Waleed, Waleed is. is, and so maybe Should he could tell us a little bit about his background and how he came to be doing what he's doing now, and then we could get into Please that. Please tell the people of this man's deeds. <laughs> Everybody on our show knows who he is, but this show is going to go much further. Exactly. So yes, let's have Waleed if we introduce could. himself. Yes, tell us a little bit about your background and uh, what you're doing now. Well, my history stems living in the Palestinian arena. I was born when my, my, my mother first arrived in a little village called Bethlehem, which you sing about us once a year, and you forget about us the rest of the year. And she met my father in the US, got married, and of course she went to visit the Middle East and she wasn't permitted to leave. She ended up uh, extending her visit, I guess, for 35 years against her will. Uh, my Arabic family side stems from my grandfather, who was a known chieftain in the arena in the area in Bethlehem, and he was uh, going to get ass assassinated by the Husseini clan for selling land to the Jewish National Fund. 
Uh, he was also connected with Hajj Amin al Husseini, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. So my history stems from a time that there was much turmoil uh, from the history of the family between Jews and Arabs. Uh, and I grew up in the Middle East environment in which, of course, I was indoctrinated with a the theology of Islam at a young age and ended up in trouble uh, in my teenage life, ended up in prison, uh, uh, came out of prison and planted an explosive charge on Bank Laumi Israel in Bethlehem. Uh, regardless to how many people want to deny this, uh, they cannot deny it because uh, there is no evidence whatsoever from any news media source that could provide material from the Israeli government that states the opposite to what I'm saying. So, having lived in the Middle East, also came to the United States, was involved in Chicago uh, with the PLO, was disenfranchised about the disunity of Arabs. I joined the Muslim Brotherhood under the wings of Jamal Saeed, who was the colleague of Abdullah Azzam, the godfather of Al-Qaeda. And that united the Arab voices together because the Muslim majority united well under Islam. And so, uh, in later on in my life, I've uh, decided to attempt to convert my wife to Islam. Uh, and my wife challenged me to show her the problems in the Bible. And the rest was history. I became Christian in 1993, was active later on after 9-11 and uh, became an analyst later on in the last few years into looking into the Middle East and so here I am finding material. I'm the first in the country to expose material that has never been revealed to Western audiences. Much material that is known, quite known in the Middle East from the Arabic language and, and, and the Arabic sources that is. So here we are, you know, I've written a book, uh, my latest book is the case for Islamophobia uh, showing uh, the uh, numerous researches I've done from the Arabic language to reveal to the Americans the type of threat they're under and the type of uh, infiltration that we have uh, in the government as well as in the education system and uh, as well in the military system. The case for Islamophobia, is it out yet? Is that book out? Yes. Yet? It oh yes, it. it's right. It. It's as a matter of fact, it's right here. The case for Islamophobia. Do you see it? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I got to get a copy. I of got that. it right here. All right. Oh, that's Pro a great Pro title. Pro yeah. Great title. Um, the I mean, we can we can we can go into his background, which is fascinating. Uh, but one very important point. You don't even know this, Waleed, but um, when 9/11 hit, uh, I grew up in in New Jersey. I watched the uh, towers go up. And then I watched them go down that morning in my house in, in South Florida. And uh, I have a, a background in, uh, in Islamic studies from a theological point of view. So I, I always understood Islam um, from a Christian uh, point of view. But then when that happened, I, I saw it now from a geopolitical point of view and a, um, a jihad point of view, all that. So I, I went back to school. I had uh, several degrees at that point, 2001 went back to school for some self-study, studied under another Walid, Walid Faris at uh, Florida Atlantic University. Great I, guy. Yep, and I, I consumed for five years everything I could on the subject, um, every seminar, every everything, and it all came to, uh, to culmination one day in November 2006 when I saw on Fox News, yeah. E.D. Hill, remember yeah. E.D. Hill? She says, we're showing this special on terrorism. It's called Obsession, Radical yeah. Islam's War Against the West. So I taped it, uh, recorded it to, uh, uh, until I can watch it quietly. And I, I watched that, um, that special. And I, I'll never forget you know, the, the, your interview and your impactful, very strong um, words in that, uh, in that movie, that documentary. And uh, that was the thing. After five years of study, watching that movie, I said, okay, I got to do something. I got to get involved. And that's when I took a step to um, go start the Florida Security Council and all this other stuff. And right after that movie, I called up the producers. I thought they'd be in New York or, right. or in L.A. Or, right. 
there are a couple of rabbis in in Jerusalem that the Clarion people that put it together. Yeah. And Walid was one of the uh, key uh, key people being interviewed in in Obsession. And by the way, we will send so, we will send people. Uh, a, a copy of Obsession. Anybody wants it, we'll send a free copy. Anybody wants a copy of Obsession, just well, contact Tom at TrentoVision.tv <laughs> Yep, Walid well, was conspiring with Jews. Yes, he was. Uh, but you, you played a significant role in uh, me. In our uh, education. Yes, and, and, uh, and we, we show that movie and I don't to know if everybody. You, I was involved in the uh, distribution of 30 million copies of that movie. So oh, you were the one. I, myself yeah, and some other folks. the instigator folks. Yep. right yes, here. Yes. I, I believe they wanted to do, uh, they, they did a documentary called Relentless. And yes, it, uh, yeah. Yeah. That, did yes. it succeed? Oh, and uh, I remember I met with Wayne Copping in South Africa and I said, what you need to do is basically show the connection between Nazism, Hajj Amin and Husseini. Yeah. And that will link to Americans because when you talk to Americans about Islam, that enters into the realm of distant history. Yep. And Americans, excuse my French, they really are lousy in history. And uh, you need to connect them to Nazism because that could, they could relate to that recent history. And that basically hit it big. So, uh, you know, thank God for Obsession. Thank God for you for distributing the video. Uh, thank God that you uh, basically uh, tasted the medicine of Islam and did something about it. I wish every Christian does something about it. Yeah, no, no. And, and Mark's been making the point. Um, is there a camera on you, Mark, or no? Mark's been making the point for a long time, the connection between Nazism and Islam. Yeah. Critically, yeah. we have and to also, we have to And also that. the comparison with uh, with the Klan. How about, in the United and, also, States. and also, the women's issue in Islam, which is, uh, which is highly critical, and the sexual deprivation of the Islamic people under the, the, the whole gamut. It's not, it not just, it's not just one particular facet of this that puts these people into the next level. There is the Nazism, there's a the women's issue, there's a the sex issue, you know, and then there's the honor issue, and th there's a whole plethora of issues that, that am I correct, Wally? It's yeah, you're correct. In fact, uh, you know, very not many Americans are aware that you know the yellow star of David the Jews had to wear came. You know, a lot of it paralleled of what was under the Omar Covenant, uh, Omar Declaration, in which Jews had to wear yellow patches on their shoulder, Jews had to walk in the narrow alleyways, uh, Jews had to ride a donkey, never ride a horse. They could never be a judge in a Muslim court. They could never adopt a Muslim child. You know, m much of this thing from the Omar covenant or Amr declaration, you know, transpired later on into Nazism. Nazism, in fact, used uh, the Armenian genocide to learn how to pack Jews in uh, trains. Uh, so, uh, he, of course, my grandfather's friend, Hajj Amin al-Husseini, was very much involved uh, with Nazism. Uh, his uh, photo is seen on the eve of the final solution. He wrote the Hungarian Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs to thwart the immigration of Jews to uh, to Israel, uh, tremendous uh, player uh, in Nazism. A Nazi war machine was composed of eight different uh, sections. Two of them were Muslim: the Bosnian, the uh, the Khanzar uh, division. The eight divisions. There was two Islamic divisions, yeah. and this part of history is rarely discussed. Nobody knows this. Yeah. Well, and I get a quick, quick question of going along those lines. Okay, we, is your mic? Can you get your mic on? Or yeah, maybe my mic's on. Right. Is uh, I get a question for you. When we were over in Israel, Tom, this is what I found interesting. It is such a key. Uh, it is such a key part of this, of Islamic history. Yet, when we're over there, the Husseini. There was no pictures of him. It's almost like he's disappeared. But the Mufti, the Grand Mufti, the Grand Mufti, Mufti yeah. it's like he's disappeared, and he's he's not on well, the walls. We were in the Israel side. I don't know if he's disappeared in Gaza or the West Bank. But what I'm that. saying is, uh, it's almost like he's become an embarrassment nationally or publicly, but inside the culture, he's oh, still okay. revered. And Absolutely. Now, in fact, is, you, need to, you need to look at the Muslim Brotherhood websites and see how revered that man right. is. Right. He's all over the Muslim Brotherhood website. He is revered as a hero. Now, we're talking about, folks, uh, 25 minutes past 5 o'clock on Wednesday, May 29th. We have an uh, Islamic expert, uh, former Muslim, now um, evangelical Christian Walid Shubat, uh, born in Bethlehem, grew up over there, giving us uh, insight. We're talking about um, the Grand Mufti 
of, uh, of Jerusalem, the, the, the chief, the big Puba Muslim of, uh, of Jerusalem who conspired with, we have, and we've shown it a million times on our video, uh, was, was, a, had a bromance. You know what a bromance is? The, the, the Christie and Obama thing? Yeah, Christie and Obama <laughs> had a bromance with Adolf Hitler, the, the Grand Mufti did. Yeah. And then they put together these killing forces and all of this. The Arab this Fuhrer, is, right. Uh, this is great. Uh, Imam Abdullah, you got a question or Damon? No, actually uh, I have a Damon question. Damon has a question. Uh, you're talking about Americans' poor sense of history and uh, uh, the way to get their attention is equating things with Nazism. Do you think part of the Muslim, um, I guess, game plan is to associate Zionism with Nazism is to get the attention. Oh, the reverse sort of way. You know, the, the, yeah. the reversal. I mean, because you see it all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, equating Zionism and Nazism. Do you, I mean, obviously it doesn't really make sense, but do you think <laughs> the Muslim world believes it or is it just a way to shock America into coming to the Islamic point of view? I think the second is true, uh, but I think equating Islamic revolution with Nazism is not just simply an equating, it is what we do basically is to show the actual history of the collaboration between Nazism with the Islamic movement. No one can find any collaboration between the Zionists and the Jews versus the Nazis. That's an impossibility. Other than the protocols. <laughs> right, so equating something uh, in a far-fetched manner is not the same as equating historic background to other historic background. The histories right. do not collide between Islamism and Nazism. In fact, Hitler himself said that, you know, uh, how much he wished that they would not have uh, the flabby religion of Christianity in Germany, that right. how much he adored Islam, it will be a much better religion for the Aryan race right. in which they could excel Islam much further than the Arabs and, and the Muslims. Uh, yes. So, you know, he basically loved Islam and hated and abhorred Christianity. So this really debunks the myth that Muslims use all the time that the Nazis were Christian. Now, this is uh, what's going through well, my mind right now. We, we need to do a regular show with you, Waleed, on, on all this Islamic stuff, yeah. apart from your investigative work. Because we're getting out there to quite a, quite a few people on the radio side. You know, we have a 50,000 watt radio covering 5 million people in South Florida. The show goes out to. Um, and uh, just to give you, a, you guys don't know this, I was driving home yesterday and I got a call. Um, a lady was listening on the, on the uh, radio and was kind of in distress over a certain situation related to kind of the stuff we do and called. Um, and you never know. You never know. And we're, right. We'll be able to help her out. But yeah, we'll have to do something with Waleed. But we got to get back to the subject matter. Well, like, the clock is fighting us. I don't want to go too deeply into this. I get hey, 20 seconds. Just to let everybody know okay. that, and Waleed, that we're broadcasting on iHeartRadio every day at 5 oh, yeah, o'clock. Yeah. WNN in South Florida on the internet streaming live on YouTube.com forward slash TrentoVision and on Waleed's site today for the next couple of days. So if you don't hear the show, it's your own fault. That's right. Uh, absolutely. Now, Waleed, you, um, you, you, you broke a story. You did an investigation into uh, Malik Obama. I think, I think he's called Roy. And uh, <laughs> the, the, whole, the whole, I've sketched it out for, <laughs> for everyone, the whole Obama family. Oh, boy. High-tech here's, graphics. Here's Mr. Right. Obama up here. Hold on. And, um, I thought that was an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like Waldo. This is Barack. I'm, Where's I'm Waldo? Lift, lift your graphic up, Tom. This is Barack Obama <laughs> Senior at the top, and uh, just just come in a little bit. And he had four wives and eight kids, um, and uh, you know Malik and Roy, Roy, who's Malik, was born over here in the '50s. Then in the '60s, '61 was Barack. The president, then a little later in the 60s, another wife, two more kids. And then in 1970, another um, kid, George, and the, the wife there is a little cloudy. But Barack Sr., <laughs> see the red over here? See these well, we, red well, we kind of, yeah. We, uh, see the red? Yeah. Um, Barack's first wife had two kids, then he got divorced, and a couple of years later, she had two kids again. And even, even Barack in his book, says we think I think those are my brothers you know but but we're not quite sure so Waleed you looked into this family and into some of their uh, 
IRS activity. Um, yeah, okay, that's good enough. And our high-tech graphics here. Tell us a little bit about your uh, your study and what you found. Give us an overview, and then we we got a lot of questions for you. Yeah. Well, I like your analogy of an octopus because every time I investigate it, I find another leg. So far, we have four legs of this octopus. We started first by looking into the Obama-Kenyan connection. And I know there's a lot of objection about looking into President Obama's Muslim connection. Uh, while the discussion over Obama's connection to his Muslim family in Kenya is uh, considered an, uh, an acceptable topic of discussion in the Arab world. It is. It is discussed here. Uh, you know, it is viewed as a great taboo in the United States. And that, that issue needs to be smashed to smithereens because, uh, you know, why is it a taboo? We ask the question, why is it a taboo to look into Obama's Islamic connection or the family who is Muslim? Exactly, exactly. Uh, well, why does he get to trot it out when it's convenient for him and the rest of us can't talk about it when it isn't? Well, correct. It, it should be considered unfair at best and in fact it should be considered purely prejudiced at worst not to discuss Obama's family. After all, you know, uh, this is the peaceful the religion. Family. What's the problem with equating Obama's family to the peace-loving religion? <laughs> the taboo should be considered unfair. Uh, in fact, the Council of American Islamic Relations care, you know, uh, it should condemn the media for keeping tight lid on the subject. Uh, it's time to go beyond what is uh, disclosed by President Obama's uh, dream of my father's or the Wikipedia version of Obama family, uh, limited information and all of that, and get into the real issues of what the activism is on the Obama family. We started investigating uh, basically three members of the family. Uh, number one would be Sarah Barack Obama, the beloved and the benevolent grandmother of our president. Then you have also Saeed Obama, his favorite uncle, and one of his closest relatives, very close to President Obama. Uh, in fact, the third one, Musa Ismail Obama, the cousin of President Obama, on the major television network on Al Jazeera, disclosed how the communication system works between the president and the Muslim Kenyan family. Uh, Saeed Obama is the chosen conduit for sending messages back and forth getting approvals from President Obama. This has been disclosed on Al Jazeera television and it's all been translated. No one so far could refute the translation work we've done. Uh, and so there's a conduit, only one person. This way, uh, you know, the secrets don't come out. But nevertheless, it leaked through Al Jazeera television uh, in which uh, the young uh, Musa Ismail Obama, who was acting as the conduit for the fundraising empire of the Kenyan side of the Obama family. It is an empire. Uh, you have two major funding groups, which is the Mama Sara Foundation, uh, in which in the English language it claims that it is for HIV victims, it claims that it is for orphans and widows, and then you have also the, the Barack H. Obama Foundation, that's attributing, attributed to the uh, father of President Obama, uh, which is basically taken care of by Malik Hussein Obama, uh, President Obama's uh, half-brother. Uh, and uh, in fact, I gained that information one year before the election, the second election of President Obama. I had itchy fingers to publish the material, but I, but I hesitated. I wanted to publish the material just before the election. Uh, and, you know, sure enough, nobody have caught it, even though it was on Al Jazeera uh, and it was uh, released for an entire year. I kept it. I saved all the media uh, and then it, and I broke the news before the election. Uh, and uh, what we found out was absolutely shocking. Uh, not only does <laughs> the monies that are claimed to go for HIV infected uh, widows and orphans uh, is going nowhere to that route at all. There is no evidence, absolutely zero evidence, from both foundations to show monies are being spent on widows, orphans, and of any of such sort. 
What we found out was Musa Ismail Obama, the representative of the Mama Sara Fund uh, on Al Jazeera, basically saying 90% of the monies that they raise from the foundation of Mama Sara goes to recruitment, sending Muslim students from Kenya uh, into the most virulent Wahhabi schools. One of them was Umm Al Qura. Um Al Qura University in Saudi Arabia was founded by Muhammad Abdul Wahhab himself, the founder wow. of Wahhabism. And the other two are the most virulent Wahhabi madrasas in the world that these uh, uh, monies raised from the United States, raised from the West, uh, Great Britain, so on and so forth, is going towards that avenue. Now, when we began to investigate, well, hey, Waleen, hang, hold it right there, because yeah, this is I very. I want to do a couple. Uh, yeah, this I, is very familiar to you. Yeah. But you just laid out a bunch of stuff that we got yeah. for our audience. Let me zero. Even in though on we have a, a brilliant audience. Let me zero in on a question. We got to break it down a, a little bit. Down let me ask one question bit. first. Hang on. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting Americans. Yes, that's right, <laughs> Americans. Right. Um, th these are the um, the two foundations. They're. They're American foundations. They're based in the United States of America, right? Well, one of them is Mama Sara does not have a 501c3, raises funds from the U.S. Uh, using a 501c3 in California right. that basically acts as a hub. So you're right, in essence. Malik Obama's foundation uh, is, is a United States foundation uh, approved a 501c3 by the IRS. All right, has uh, has anybody pulled their um, their 990s the, to see what kind of money is going through this these organizations? No, not okay. at all. Okay, that that could be something. Uh, you had a question uh, because uh, you, all the C3s, 501C3s, have to uh, they've got to report their 990s. We are a 501C3, and every year we do our taxes. We have to say um, if somebody donated over five thousand dollars, we got to put their name down. Yeah, you got to show everything, right? And um, these are sometimes they're hard to get, but they are a matter of, of now, public record if they're C threes. That quick track status on five hundred one C three, or do they have to go through the same heartaches that the Tea Party groups? Well, went we're going to find that out how how these groups got their C three status because he reveals that in uh, in, okay. in the article. But again, yeah, that was that was one of the questions that I wanted to get into was when were these foundations registered in the United States? And, and can you, are you able to show um, a direct link between Barack Hussein Obama, the president, and these foundations themselves? Or, or is it I like mean, or is he, Billy or, Carter? Are there so <laughs> many um, degrees of separation that he could just say, you know what, I, you know, sure, I'm related to them, but I don't have anything to do with those foundations, I don't endorse them. Um, I, I don't profit from them, I don't help my family members profit from them, and I have nothing to do with it. Is he able to distance himself from it, or can you connect them? And if so, how? I mean, what's the evidence for that? Well, it's a, a very good question uh, when it comes to the issue of the IRS. The IRS illegally retroactivated his tax deductible status, according, uh -huh. in fact, to the National Legal Policy Center, which is a watchdog group that investigated the issue when he didn't have a 501c3, was astonished that the 501c3 status by the IRS was uh, retroactivated, uh, w in which no one in the in the entire country can get it that fast. He wasn't. He was uh, basically forging and claiming that he was a 501c3 for a couple two three years before that this is malik you're talking malik, about malik obama correct okay. and when it was found out he uh, corrected the problem but it is impossible to correct such a problem without investigating what happened in the last two years he was collecting all this monies in fact the address that was given to the irs is a bogus address it is a ups store everything was bogus in the application uh, with the IRS and how did the IRS retro retroactivated this so speedily it's impossible unless there was favoritism involved in other words it seems very clear and uh, uh, we have good reason to believe that the reason Barack H Obama foundation gained this status so quickly is because there was influence 
using the Barack Obama name. No, really? No. no. no that's, that's crazy. You know, what, what has to happen if you guys have not done this yet, uh, you gotta, we've got to lay the, the timeline out yeah. of the, um, the filing of the C3 application, well, the time the complaint, the time he started raising money, and see if it uh, parallels the Obama administration uh, and their their current and the scandal. White House visitor list well, of the director of the IRS yeah. who paid over 100 visits to the White House mm -hmm. during Obama's first term versus one visit to the White House during George W. Bush's second Because term. that would, uh, you may have done that, but that, that would be very interesting that, that the IRS is giving the conservative organizations hard time, you know, you're not getting your C3, you're not getting your C4, and all of a sudden out of Kenya, you know, uh, the Kenyans come in and he lives yeah. in, Malik lives in Washington, D.C., and then he goes, oops, you know, I think I need a C3, and the IRS goes, no problem, here it is, and guess what? It goes back to whatever you wanted to go back to. Right. That is very interesting. And this is a picture of President Obama with, with his brother, half-brother Malik. Is that Malik? That's, That's Malik. Malik. Okay. Right, and, it's, and there's you know, another picture of Malik and or his organization and just to ex explain you know hey, hey Waleed this is the picture I don't know if you can see these but there's a picture of uh, Malik with the president it looks like in the Oval Office yeah right. correct and, and then there's a picture of Malik uh, speaking at a podium now yeah. what is that all about where he's that's speaking at the at a IDO right yeah that's a that's yeah. the podium is actually even more interesting than the 501c3 you know i wish that you could help me in uh, gaining more information as far as to the 501c3 i focus on the middle eastern issues uh so when it comes to malik obama's photo there on the podium what americans don't understand is the significance of this he is not on the podium in front of a group that wants to donate monies for widows and orphans he is in company <clears throat> of some of the most wanted people on earth. <laughs> in that event, he is addressing his bosses. And his bosses are Omar al-Bashir, uh, who is wanted by the International Criminal Court oh, wow. <laughs> Great. on seven counts of mass murder. And we're talking about Darfur. We're talking about the Darfur that President Obama wanted to bring to justice the culprits and oh, yeah. yet at the same rate president obama thwarts the southern sudanese from uh, taking action anytime they want to take course, action of course. against the attacks yeah and there also in that podium sitting next to him uh, is his boss let's first understand that relationship his boss is swar dahab swar dahab is the director and chairman of what is called the Islamic Da'wah organization. Da'wah literally means the call to Islam, building madrasas. This organization is the organization in Sudan that is responsible for building madrasas and mosques throughout the, sub, the African subcontinent. There is about maybe 40 to 60 extensions of it. One of them is in Kenya. And Malik Hussein Obama, is the executive uh, secretary for that organization. And let's understand what organization the Islamic Dawah organization is centered at. It is supervised and centered in the country of Sudan. Sudan is considered by the State Department a state harbors terrorism. It's a terrorist state. We're not talking about people who want to bow five times towards Mecca. We are talking about the madrasas. We are talking about those madrasas that, for example, the man that butchered uh, uh, the British officer in London just uh, last week, I believe. Uh, this man was recruited in a madrasa in Kenya, the same country of Malik Obama. This is the kind of activity Malik Obama is doing, is building the same kind of madrasas and facilities that educates under the system of Wahhabism that produces terrorism. Let's not forget what the American government stated about now, madrasas. Now, just to highlight what you're saying is, uh, we're putting up a graphic right now, and uh, go ahead and say those names for us there. Uh, no, there's a, a different guy in that picture. This is the, 
This is the photo. No, this uh, is Aldi. This is Aldi. The this guy is a fantastic photo. It is a swallow to hop of the idea and uh, Hanyeya from Hamas, the uh, and Kwaradari and uh, Yusuf Kwaradari, the uh, what spiritual. is that all about? It is the three stooges. <laughs> <laughs> Waleed, what is that photo all about? Swar Dahab is his direct boss, Malik Obama's direct Are boss. Are you kidding me? He is the chairman of the Dawah organization stationed in Sudan. Uh, in fact, uh, you could see Swar Dahab visiting with Hamas, with Khaled Mash'al, alongside Sheikh Yusuf Al Qaradawi, the spiritual head of the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, in our disclose, what we disclosed in the videos, those videos should be shown on your show. Uh, he was speaking to Khalid Mash'al in Hamas, oratory style, classical Arabic language. The boss of Malik Obama stated the following. I have been awaiting to being with you for so long. With you who? Hamas. Regardless of our distance, Jerusalem will be brought back. The Sudanese will not falter on participating in jihad an actual advocating terrorism in front of Khaled Mash'al in the auspices of Hamas considered a terrorist organization and a terrorist entity and this whole program goes even further let's not forget what Sudan is Sudan is the one that begat the popular Arab and Islamic conference who begot the meeting with representatives from the Hamas Egyptian Islamic Jihad, Algerian Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda who killed 3,000 Americans, uh, uh, the Iranian terrorists, the, you know, uh, this is all involved in a big package with terrorists, terrorist organizations. This is why I changed my article to say the Obamas or Malik Obamas in bed with terrorists, not just speaking to them, but in bed with them and partnering with them. It goes further than this. The, our documentation shows that even that organization, the Islamic uh, Dawa organization, partners, now is in partnership with the Muslim World League, which had its tentacles involved in Al-Qaeda in 9-11, as well as the, uh, the uh, WAMI, the, uh, uh, the Muslim Youth. WAMI is the World Association of Muslim Youth. And in fact, we show the photos of the meeting, partnering with those as well. WAMI was also part and parcel of involvement. The Philippines, for example, the Philippines WAMI was involved in uh, uh, supporting Al Qaeda, considered to be a terrorist entity. So we talking about a major, major issue, in which I basically scratched the surface. I have. Wow. I have a question sure. here. Okay, if Malik's name was anything but Obama. Do you think his name would be on the terrorism watch list? I believe would, if Malik Obama didn't have the last name Obama, yeah. he would be a long time arrested and thrown in prison. Because we're talking about financiering. You know, it needs to be investigated whether it's considered financiering of terrorism. Uh, you know, Malik Obama is very much up to his neck with this kind of involvement with these organizations. Uh, he, he is, cons he, he does have U.S. residents. In other words, the laws in the United States, when you are a U.S. resident, have a yes. 501c3 mm -hmm. raising these kind of funds. You know, you are un applicable under the laws of the United States. And it goes <laughs> further. Even the president of the United States having such associations brings a major problem because we have something called CARL, commitment to the United States. A, associations. When we talk about associations, we say, you know, it's guilt by association. Sure, Tom, you could be associated with any Tom, Dick, and Harry you want, but you're not in the government. Yeah, right, exactly. Okay. Well, this president... Go ahead. Yeah, this president already <laughs> has terrorist, well-documented connections and associations, which everybody knew before he was elected. Who's his buddies? <laughs> Bill Ayers? His biographer? Rashid Khalidi? Edward Come on. Said, yeah, sure. I, I mean, what, what's the difference between what he, what Malik Obama is doing from the Holy Land Foundation trial? Exactly. Uh, well, you, you know, if well, you this compare is worse Ayers because with Malik Obama, Malik Obama is involved in Wahhabism in Sudan. Uh, Sudan is a government that 
succeeded in their killings of millions of people. Two million people. Yeah. I, I, can, I, you, can you imagine if Mitt Romney had these associations? His brother was uh, a, a lieutenant in the in the mafia or something. Or the KKK. You know, yeah. Or the KKK. Yeah. The Mormon mafia. And, you know, no, 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 no. Yeah, no. You know. I think the fact that he has stock in Chick Fil A just disqualifies yeah, yeah. him <laughs> from being president. So let's That's just true. end the conversation. I, there. I have a question for for for, for our lead and. Uh, Thinking from the opposition side, I've noticed when we've gone into Moss, Tom, like when Orlando Moss funds Hamas, when we caught them funding Hamas inside there, right. we saw George Galloway say Barack Hussein Obama, and they didn't know we were filming them. Right. Now, and also when you talk to Muslims, as Muslims, just one on one, and don't try to, uh, you know, proselytize. Yeah, proselytize or anything. You, you're just talking with them. You come to find out that they really truly believe that Barack Obama is a Muslim. How much does that ideology, that, now this is the United States, how much does the outside world think looking at these associations like we are and saying, oh God, he's a total Muslim. How, how, and how much does that destroy U.S.'s credibility in dealing with war and terror? Well, as far as Obama's Islam, you got to look at what his Kenyan family says. I have the statements in my research. I can't quote them verbatim. Uh, but uh, Mama Sara basically complimented the president of being having grown uh, in a good Muslim family. Uh, they don't like to discuss his supposed Christian conversion. That's his uh, off limits. Uh, in other words, you know, they'd never want to affirm that President Obama is really a Bible believing Christian of any sort. Well, I don't think uh, anybody believes that. <laughs> is a black theology believing guy. Liberation black, black liberation theology. theology. But, but the question was, how does the Muslim world view a Barack Obama? Well, it, 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 it is divided. Al-Qaeda doesn't like President Obama. Uh, but in Egypt, you have the most famous dates that are sold in the streets. They renamed the date. They called it Obama date. <laughs> <laughs> the Egyptian, well, the Egyptians must love him, of course. I mean, he he put the he put the brotherhood in. in yeah. Sure, yeah. Right. I mean, he's the one that went, did his historic speech That's in Cairo, right. insisting that the Muslim Brotherhood be present when the Muslim Brotherhood was considered as a terror entity under the Egyptian government, Husni yeah. Mubarak, mm -hmm. and it was President Obama who broke that and allowed uh, the Muslim Brotherhood to be included in his speeches. So he's the one that gave the green light to the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, it's known fact in the Middle East that it was Obama's elections and we, they had a tight window to basically move very fast in their agenda. And in fact, this is the whole issue of the Arab Spring. We've seen the results of the Arab Spring. It's became an Islamic winter. It's no thanks to President Obama. The speech was uh, you know, involving Rashad Hussein. In fact, how many Americans knew the speechwriter of President Obama, Rashad Hussein, was interviewed by Al Ahram uh, uh, news, newspaper? That is the top newspaper in Egypt. Uh, Al Ahram newspaper asked him point blank, You are a Muslim. You are supposed to serve the Muslim cause. You work for the president. And then he said, uh, You need to intervene regarding the nuclear issues. Rashad Hussein said and responded, I will intervene when the right time comes. I was the first to break that piece of news, but there is very little interest from the Americans to look at that news. Sure. Did Uma have anything to do with the Brotherhood being invited well, to that? Hang on oh. to Uma, because we're, we're starting okay. to run out of time here. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left, Waleed, but uh, Dave has a question back there. Um, my question would be, is, is uh, as an American, and uh, you know, just getting into this and, and really starting to wrap my head around this, and. Uh, not think that maybe it's propaganda or something like that. How much trouble, danger, do you put yourself in coming out to express the truth on this issue, uh, being that you were at one time inside the organization, kind of like the Italian mob, if you came out, uh, we all knew what happened. Well, uh, I'm not going to answer the second question. Uh, I'm going to answer the first question as far as, you know, the danger to my life. I'm not interested about my life. Uh, uh, my soul is prepared. The question is, is yours prepared? Is uh, Brother Trento's prepared? And that's what I first learned when I became Christian. 
Jesus himself said, if you try to save your life, you will lose it. If you try to lose your life, you will save it. Hear me and Tom trying to lose our lives, thank God, by God's grace, we're still living. However, when you stated, uh, I'm not sure, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this, uh, I'm not sure if this is a rumor, or uh, let's make something certain here. The Malik Obama's involvement is very much covered in the Middle East. The coverage is huge. Oh. Even CNN covered it. How many Americans know CNN, the Arabic language? I did not know that. Covered it. I can send you the links. You can look at CNN in the Arabic language and read under his official status as the uh, executive secretary of the Muslim uh, Islamic Da'wah organization, as well as Al Watan uh, referenced it, which CNN referenced from Al Watan in Yemen. You have the Adan News uh, covered this. You have the Kull Al Watan covered it. You have the 14th of October covered it. You have the na uh, na uh, Nas, uh, I, could, I can't read the name, but you have Hadramaut covered it. You have uh, Al Sahwa covered it in Saudi Arabia. You have the newspaper Uqaz, one of the most reputable newspapers in Saudi Arabia covered it. You have Al Riyadh covered it, Saures covered it. You have Al Litni in Egypt covered it, Al Jumhuriya. A litany of news media covered it in Sudan. My question is, how come no American covered it? Why am I the only one who covered it? And we're gonna we're gonna answer that question tomorrow when you come back, uh, Waleed, because we're just about out of time with you. You will come back tomorrow, correct? That is correct. All right. Yeah. We will we will see you tomorrow on that cliffhanger. We want you to uh, tell us a bit about the sl sex slavery that's involved with the. The, uh, the Sudan, Kenya, Obama yeah. connection, and all, all of the grisly details there. But folks, this I is, this get is into, quite... And we want to get more into President Obama's connection to, to these foundations and, and, and these activities and how he helps them by hindering the legitimate prosecution of... Uh, <laughs> of the former leader of Sudan. All right, thanks. It was it was amazing. Thank it, you. It was. It was. We'll see you tomorrow, Wally. Take care. And uh Assalamu alaykum. <laughs> Assalamu alaykum. Oh man. All right, that was uh Wally Chubat, folks. He is uh, he will be back tomorrow. This is Tom Trento. We're on WNN 1470 on the radio side. If you're watching on the internet, uh, trentovision.tv, you can even be watching at theunitedwest.org. As Mark said earlier, you can listen on iHeartRadio. Great way of, of following us, listening to us. I think uh, our analytics show something like 40% of the people are following the show on, uh, on uh, smartphones, yeah. either cool. listening or That's watching surprising. it. Yeah, it's pretty good. But tomorrow we will have uh, Waleed back tomorrow, Thursday, the 30th of May. We'll get more into these details. This is some crazy stuff, man. Even though we know what's going on, it's still crazy. But right now we got to say goodbye. Say goodbye, CJ. Goodbye.